The S&P 500 has been green 16 out of the last 18 weeks. That has not happened since 1971. You are in what I would call a very historically bullish market, maybe for the right or wrong reasons. Here in this video, we will go over all of your major events happening this week and how they could, well, potentially hurt the markets. I think it's clear with that statistic in mind, there's not a lot of downside events or event risk priced into our markets right now. The expectation is we're going to have a soft landing. S&P 500 earnings growth is going to be about 11%. The Fed's going to start cutting rates. That, again, helps us avoid a recession. And all things are going to be fine and dandy peaches and roses from this point going ahead. Then again, you have to give credit to the bulls because as we started 2024, markets were pricing in seven rate cuts. You're now only pricing in three rate cuts. So there's not a lot of risk there in my personal opinion. Maybe we only get two rate cuts, but is that really a big deal? Markets have went straight up and you've unpriced 1% of rate cuts by the Fed since the start of 2024, and it's had no effect on the markets. So whether we get one, two, or three rate cuts, I don't think that's going to really move the markets. To the contrary, if the Fed starts to talk about rate cuts not even happening in 2024, maybe that could give you a downside surprise, some downside in our markets. I don't think people are exactly expecting that because if we don't get a rate cut in 2024 then maybe that opens the door for the next move to be a rate hike if inflation does continue on the trend that we've seen over the past two months of actually going higher you also have to give it to the bulls with this next statistic now if markets are up in january and in february well you tend to actually get about a 20 percent move higher over the next 12 months in equities. So 2024 looks like it could be a pretty good year, but then you have to you have to ask yourself, have we just priced in too much good news? Have markets rallied too aggressive? Because let's be honest, this market right now is very much dictated by the AI trade. If the AI trade were to take a bit of a breather, as I expect it will around March 12th, that's not this week, but March 12th is next Tuesday when you have the arm lockup period, could cause a lot of selling in arm stock that could, you know, trigger algorithms to also sell NVIDIA, AMD, SMCI maybe Microsoft, some of your other higher flying names. And let's just be honest, without the AI trade, your average stock has actually fell in 2024. The average stock has not done that well. This is a chart of the percent of stocks above their 50-day moving average. It's currently at 55%, which is not a terrible number. But it's not a great number either. It's 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 not a number that would be reflective of the S&P being up 16 out of the last 18 weeks. The strongest market, quote unquote, the strongest market since 1971. In fact, the average stock is not doing much of anything. To start 2024, 86% of stocks were above their 50-day moving average. Most stocks. Today, it's basically a coin flip. Search says money supply is a leading indicator of inflation and has fallen from 27% in 2021 to negative 2% year over year. This suggests continued disinflation over the next 6 to 12 months, and we believe the Fed's 2% target will arrive soon. But I think a lot of people believe inflation is tied to the business cycle now more than the money supply or more than anything else. And I think that's really an open-ended question. I don't think you can sit here and say just because the money supply is down 2% year over year when it was up 27% in 2021, that that's really enough to give you massive disinflation. I don't think that's just 
the simplest way to put things. And if this is true, this could be... Well, not so great for the Bulls. Seth Golden writes this on X. He says the Nasdaq finally made a new all-time high, but the cycle composite does not show as much favor over the coming months for the growth index. If we are here, then this could mean uh, some selling to come, maybe quite a bit of selling to come, a dip that starts in March that goes all the way down into the really start of June, a rally during the summertime, and then sell off towards the election itself, which this wouldn't surprise me if this is the path ahead for the markets, and then obviously a rally towards the end of the year. And, uh, you know, what's crazy about this chart, it's almost following perfectly to, you know, this blue line, right? This dotted yellow line, almost identical almost identical to the blue line, at least so far. So if we are truly here and this is correct, then this upcoming week could see some sharp downside. You also seen last week that consumer confidence fell to 106.7 in February, missing expectations of 115.0. Meanwhile, the January consumer confidence was revised significantly lower. This marked the biggest downward revision since February of 2022. Meanwhile, we have seen four straight months with sharp drops in consumer confidence. Question is, why are consumers losing confidence? And this is the longest streak of declining consumer confidence we have seen in a long time. This goes back to September of 2023. And well, obviously, the markets have done very well since then. So there's really a disparity going on somewhere out there in the economy. I would make an argument that the average citizen out there is drowning in debt with $1.15 trillion of credit card debt, let alone over a trillion dollars of student loan debt that just those payments just started for about 80% of borrowers. I mean, wages aren't even close to catching up with the cost of living. You know, economists can say whatever they want. They could try to put numbers together. But dollar for dollar, pound for pound, your two, three dollar raise you have seen over the past couple of years has not even come close to equaling out inflation. You know, back in the 70s, 60s, 50s, the average family could buy the average home in America today. You have to make about 45% more than the average family to buy the average home. That just doesn't work. The math doesn't math there. So, of course, consumer confidence is low and people don't feel great. I guess the question is, does that translate to lower stock prices? And I would say probably not. It could translate to lower economic activity, lower spending, which spending accounts for 70 to 73 percent of GDP. And that could be a surprise to the downside for the markets at some point in 2024. You also have the delinquency rate with large banks that just hit 3%, the highest in 11 years, and the delinquency rate among small banks that just hit 7.8%, also the highest on record. Also worth noting that auto loan delinquencies are now at 7.7%, the highest that you have seen in the last 13 years so statistically people are falling behind and not doing great does that translate into lower economic activity lower growth for the economy at some point it will question is when and the real question is for you if you're watching this video when does that affect the markets well currently bad news economic bad news is seen as good news for the markets because that means the fed can start cutting rates sooner but on average, when the Fed starts cutting rates, they're doing so because something is not good out there. Something is looking bad or something broke in the economy or in financial markets. And you typically see a decline of about 23%. And it takes about 190 days to bottom after the first Fed rate cut. So normally, the best time for stocks is when the Fed is paused. That's usually after inflation has come down, the Fed's paused, and nothing has broke yet. 
That's normally when stocks do the best. Think about the 18-month pause that the Fed had back in 07, 08, right? Before things got bad, it was a good market as the Fed was actually raising rates from basically zero to five and a quarter percent over the course of really, you know, uh, 2003 or so through 2008. Maybe it was like 05 to, you know, 2008. Doesn't matter. From the great financial crisis through 08, as the Fed was raising rates, um, you know, or dot com bubble, right, to 08, markets did fine. It's actually an anomaly for the markets to do poorly when the Fed is raising rates in, in recent times, that is, because normally the economy is doing well when the Fed raises rates. When the Fed is cutting, usually the economy is not doing well. Maybe that's when things start to catch up to us. And maybe at some point, bad economic data will turn into bad news for the markets. Here in this upcoming week, you're not going to have anything on Monday. On Tuesday, you will get ISM services PMI. The lower, the better here. Last month, you were at 53.4. You're expecting 52.5. A number higher than last month is definitely going to be bad news. You're going to get factory orders month over month. You're expecting negative 3%. Last month was only positive 0.2%. So that's quite a big decline on a month over month basis. Tuesday, you will also get Fed Bar that will speak at noon. Fed Bar again at 3.30 p.m. And that's pretty much it. On Wednesday, you have uh, Jerome Powell that will testify here at 10 o'clock in the morning. If he gives us new information, that would be important. Something along the lines of we may not cut rates in 2024, that would be bad news. Or if the Fed says, yeah, we plan on cutting rates a few times in 2024, that's probably good news. I think Powell's a little more straightforward and simple there i I think he's going to say the economy is doing just fine that's why they're not cutting rates yet inflation's coming down overall i think powell is likely to be positive for our markets if not just neutral not really negative again unless we get new information and during these senate banking uh testimonies that's usually not the platform in which the fed likes to give us bad news you're also going to get the Jolt job openings that will be coming out, and uh, you want to watch this very closely, I think, whether or not the markets you know, pay attention, because if job openings fall sharply, that's a sign that hiring is slowing down, and that's a bad sign for the economy and could be a bad sign for the markets, depending on what kind of drop we see. If that goes higher, that's actually good news. That means the economy is likely doing fine and businesses continue to want to hire more people. And, you know, I've never really understand the whole bad news is good news, good news is bad news for the markets. I get why the markets feel that way, but in the longer term sense, bad news is bad news and good news is good news. You want to see the economy doing as good as possible, always, right? If you are a bull, of course, if if you're a bear, you probably are shorting the markets and well it's been rough for you anyways but maybe uh maybe those shorts start to work a little bit better in uh in this upcoming week really over the next couple of weeks with that arm lockup period on march 12th that's going to be a big event now wednesday at noon you will have fed daily that will be speaking and that's pretty much it now on thursday you're going to get uh, Fed Jerome Powell yet again. Now, if we're going to get new information, it's probably going to be on Wednesday. So I don't think Thursday is going to be a big deal at all. You will get consumer credit change. Last month, you increased about $1.56 billion to uh, the credit debt out there. You're expecting $10 billion for the month of January. So that's a big big jump there. Um, so we'll see what uh, what that number comes in as. You will get used car prices month over month and year over year. That's important for uh, your inflationary outlook. There's no expectations here, but used car prices month over month last month were 0% and year over year, they were down 9.2%. So a gain there, definitely not going to be seen as great news for uh, the inflation fight. On Friday, you're going to have some very big data coming out. That is non-farm payrolls. Last month, you came in at 353,000 jobs, and you're expecting 190,000 jobs for the month of February. Normally, January, February tend to be the time in which companies end up laying people off from the you know Christmas holiday shopping season. That clearly did not happen last month with 353,000 job ads. That's that's a crazy number. Average hourly um, hours worked, right, or weekly hours worked, 
did start to fall quite a bit. And uh, the participation ratio, I mean, continued to rise. So overall, pretty... Um, Pretty good numbers that we had last month. Really good numbers. Little too good number of, of, of numbers to really support the Fed cutting rates anytime soon. But we'll see if this number does come in low on Friday. That could be taken as bad news. Especially, you know, one day we will get a negative non-farm payroll number. And it will be seen as bad news for the markets. I don't know if it's going to be this Friday. But eventually that will happen. You're also expecting the unemployment rate to stay the same at 3.7%. The same as last month. Now here is your earnings calendar for the week ahead. Monday in after hours you have GitLab that will report. Tuesday you have Neo, Target, and Pre-Market. Tuesday and after hours, CrowdStrike, ChargePoint, Ross, Nordstrom, Box, um, BioNano, Genomics, a couple other companies as well. Wednesday, pre-market, JD.com, Abercrombie & Fitch, Foot Locker, EVGo, Campbell's, Unify, and there's many other companies here. These are just the ones that have the most analysts covering them, if you will. Wednesday and after hours, Victoria's Secret and uh, Honest. Thursday pre-market, Kroger, Big Lots, Burlington, American Eagle Outfitter, Billy Buy, PaySafe, and that's pretty much it. And then on Thursday and after hours, your AI stocks will be back in focus again. Broadcom, yeah, that stock went crazy on Friday. It's gone very crazy over the past year or so. That's a big one for your AI semiconductor trade. If they give you not so great earnings, that would really put a damper on all of them. Costco, uh, I mean, that's not an AI stock, but a really big high flyer in that industry. That's also an important one to be watching. Marvel, another AI stock to watch. MongoDB, DocuSign, Samsara, Petrobras, and uh, Gap, as well as uh, Runway. And then Friday pre-market, um, really, there's nothing to speak of. Implied moves by some of these biggest earnings this week. You have GitLab up here at 16% plus or minus. Crazy move expected there. Neo at about 13%. Target at about 7 to 8% Tuesday pre-market. CrowdStrike around 12%. Ross at about 5.5%. Abercrombie & Fitch pricing in 15%. Holy moly, Gene Galore there. Wow. JD at about 10%. THO at about 8%. CPB at about 5%. Thursday, really your big day, I think, for the broader markets. CrowdStrike can be important. Target can be important. GitLab can be important. You've seen like Jim Cramer talk about GitLab on Friday as he expects the company is going to do well. And they're pricing in a lot for the options market. So people have high expectations. Now, it's really Thursday and after hours that's going to be important for the broader markets. Uh, Gap is expected to move 14%. Marvel at about 12%. Crazy. DocuSign at about 9%. Um, Avgo, which is Broadcom, around 7%. And Costco around 4%. I think if there are some trades this week, they're probably not in these stocks that are pricing in a big move. Target. Maybe Ross, but I've got burned on them a few times on earnings. But Target, Avgo, and Costco look like some very interesting trades just because the options are not pricing in much. And what we've seen this earnings season is companies can move 20% up or down, no matter if you're a Target, a Broadcom, or a Costco, on good or bad numbers. Also worth mentioning is this chart just showing hedge fund positioning so in really a summary here price action is bullish in markets positioning is bearish and the most offensive it has been since 2008 great financial crisis according to bank of america so positioning very weighted towards defensives like healthcare, utilities consumer staples companies people cannot live without cyclicals cyclically inclined companies to uh you know the economy is uh consumer discretionary energy tech industrials and materials now i would say tech is a little bit more defensive now than it is cyclical because a lot of tech um probably doesn't revolve around what the economy does but yeah people are pretty defensively positioned right now which I think, given where the markets are, that's probably a pretty good way to be positioned. 
um, you're at all time highs, you probably get some resistance here and you probably do come down. Question is, does this week start that larger term uh, turn down downtrend? And I think that is really going to come down to later into the week at least on Wednesday, if you get new information from Powell, the non-farm payroll report on Friday, as well as your quote-unquote AI stocks that report earnings on Thursday. If we do get a fall in the markets this week, target support around 500. If you don't hold support there, you do have a gap to fill that could send you down to about 497, maybe as low as 493. That would be a nice little kind of pullback. Uh, I definitely wouldn't call that a correction, uh, but that could, you know, take you down about two and a half percent or so. I think it's probably about time that we get a pullback of two to three percent but we will ultimately see let me know what you think about this information down below in the comment section hit the like button as well as subscribe to the channel if you have not done so already thank you for watching enjoy the rest of your sunday and i will see you in the next one